last Marvel movie I've seen was The Avengers, and let's be honest, that was amazing. You know, that was every comic book fan's dream, to see all those characters on a big screen. So, I mean, I'm curious, because it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's Marvel's kind of darkest period, and I'm just curious how helpful Marvel were, because, you know, when I, when I look at it, I see a lot of faces, obviously, who work at Marvel, but there's a lot of faces missing <coughs> as well, which is quite interesting, because... It's a bit like, you know, people don't like to show photos of themselves when they're age 14 or 15 and they don't look so good. <laughs> it's a little bit like that, like Disney aren't making documentaries about Marvel the bankruptcy years, you know, but you guys have. So can you tell us a little bit about what you encountered when you started making this? Can I talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no comment, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, actually, uh, at the beginning, uh, um, when we started to, to make this, to write the documentary, we got in touch with the Disney people. Uh, in France, um, and they were very enthusiastic about the project mm. uh, because so um, Marvel now is, a, is since uh, 2009 Marvel is a, s a Disney subsidiary, and so we w we thought that the most logical thing uh, prior to make that film was to get in touch with the Disney people and gain getting through this channel to get in touch with Marvel uh, in the US. And the Disney uh, uh, people uh, were very happy about the project. They, we, they read uh, the first outline uh, of the movie and they, they thought it was a terrific uh, idea. And, and we said, yes, of course it is. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there, were, there were plans to, uh, like, like uh, to co-produce the movie yeah. with, uh, uh, even, uh, they, I remember they even told uh, during lunch, uh, the, our lunch with them, they, they teased us with a possible uh, uh, broadcast on ABC, ABC, which is also a, a, a Disney subsidiary. Yeah. And so we were so excited after this, uh, this lunch, I remember. And unfortunately, the months passed and we had still no answers from uh, from Disney or Marvel uh, when it came to our uh, interview request for mm. for this doc documentary. And in uh, the late in late uh, 2012, we received in, in December, <laughs> the December 31, we received an email from the Marvel legal department uh, that Happy New Year, <laughs> Happy New Year guys, <laughs> <laughs> we won't help you. <laughs> Okay, uh, and so it's, it's a true story. We received uh, <laughs> uh, an email from the legal department, uh, a very short mail that said that uh, they were really happy uh, with the interest we had in the company, but that they could not help us with making the movie. And they, they added that uh, we had to be, they, they would not uh, keep us from making the film, but we had to be very cautious about the way we would treat the Marvel brand in the next movie. 1.5 billion dollars worldwide and that's how much money Avengers made. That's one of the most successful films of all time. Did you find creators were equally a little bit frightened about talking as well or as well as you know the people on staff? Did you find that freelancers were a little bit nervous about talking to you guys? Had there maybe been an email you know? Um, to, to not? It, it took a lot of emails to convince people yeah. uh, apart from you. <laughs> I'll talk to anyone. Thank I had nothing so else much. to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but that's right. You you, you answered quite uh, quite quickly, and uh, and, um, and and thanks to Mark. Uh, Mark doesn't tell because he's very modest. But uh, I'm not modest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with us, I could. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's all an act. He has been very helpful with uh, with that film, uh, and uh, we we won't be able to thank him enough uh, for that. And um, it it took a lot of mails to convince uh, some people. Uh, some others, uh, and mainly people from the movie business. Uh, yeah. in, um, originally, we wanted to interview much more people from the movie business in this film. Uh, we had like John Trevor or uh, Brian Singer, mm. Sam, Sam Raimi, yes. and uh, um, we had we even had uh, uh, agreements from uh, uh, producers. Uh, uh, and but once these people learned that Marvel would not back this movie, would not support this movie. All of them uh, said, uh, "Sorry, but uh, we can't. We can't talk to you. We won't, we, we can't uh, be um, at odds with uh, Marvel. Yeah. And uh, if Marvel doesn't support your movie, we can talk to you." As recently as two or three years ago, we also lived under the fear that, oh my God, one bad superhero movie is going to happen, and the whole Hollywood industry is going to give up and not do it anymore. That's not the case anymore. Why do you think Marvel went from being a complete catastrophe creatively? and financially, which it, it was, you know, towards the end of the 90s, you couldn't read those books, and there was no interest in the characters in Hollywood. 
Why do you think those uh, four years changed everything? What, uh, from the outside looking in, you, you guys could be more forensic about it. You know, what, what do you think happened? You said forensic? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> uh, it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was a... a we are not uh, historians, so uh, I think there are, there are certainly a lot of details uh, in, the r the real, in the real story that we missed, probably. We did our best to, uh, like you said, to cover all the angles. But to answer your question, I think that uh, during those four years between the end of uh, Marvel bankruptcy and the beginning of their incredible adventure on screen, the, there has been a, a perfect storm of, it's, it was a combination of uh, a generation of um, Hollywood talents that were children in the 70s mm -hmm. and who reached their 40s or mid 40s in Hollywood and who were in charge yeah. uh, and who took this material seriously, just like uh, Tom DeSanto say mm -hmm. in the movie. And it was a perfect storm, uh, a perfect storm of that, a generation of uh, uh, makers uh, who were in charge in Hollywood. Uh, the visual effects progress, the, yeah, the visual effects who, uh, who came to a state of, uh, that made a movie like Spider-Man possible. Yeah. It was one of the big reasons why Spider-Man couldn't be made also on screen. Uh, James Cameron, I know, had problems with that. Uh, yeah. uh, how do you make Spider-Man in the early 90s uh, without the, the possibility of making it a full CGI creature? Yeah. It was a big problem for Spider-Man. And I think that, so the combination of generation, um, a new generation, the, the CGI's, um, and the, sort of the technology, and also I think uh, the progress of the whole geek culture thing on the internet, on the on the networks, uh, and the, the the feeling that pop culture was becoming a real um, a s economic asset, uh, a, a, a real s stake of power and and all that combined in the late 90s and with the, 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 right, the, the, the arrival of two, the two right men at the right moment, Javier Rad and Ike Perlmutter, yeah. made all this possible. It's very difficult to explain that in English because it's not our uh, natural language. Plus the well, it's not our natural language either, don't worry. <laughs> but although you had a limited number of people you guys could talk to, I did feel there was almost nothing you missed. I feel it's very comprehensive. I mean, is there, is there somebody you wanted? Was there an angle that you, you'd heard about that you, you somehow didn't g get out on, on the film? Was, it, was there anything that you would do in a director's cut maybe in 10 years once all those guys are fired? <laughs> <coughs> um, actually, we, had, um, we interviewed a lot more people that, uh, that the ones you, can, you got to see in the final uh, editing of this film. Um, and because of the one hour format, we had to cut a lot of uh, people out of this, uh, this movie. And it was very painful. I think that uh, despite the fact that the, the we, we span a 20, it's a 20 years uh, span in the life of Marvel that we learn this story yeah. in this film, in, in just one hour, I think we approximately managed to, to cover almost all the angles mm. of the story. But of course, that there are many details that we had to to skip because uh, we, we did not have time enough in one hour. So uh, I remember there was a wall. We interviewed, for instance, uh, a lawyer called uh, Carol Handler uh, in Los Angeles. She's the lawyer who helped the uh, legal entanglement about Spider-Man to be solved in the late 90s. She's the lady who helped this case because Spider-Man could not, could not be made uh, as a film for more than 10 years in Hollywood between the, the the early 90s and the late 90s, and she's the one who found the legal loophole in the contracts that right. uh, finally, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in 48 hours, helped this whole case to be solved. And, and, and she helped Spider-Man to be, uh, 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 the Spider-Man property to go back to Marvel, and, uh, and, and Marvel in this way could sell it to Sony, and Sony could make this movie. And so we wanted to tell the story in the, in the movie, but it was too complicated, too long, and we had to, we had to skip it. It's and almost there. another movie in itself, isn't it? That's yes, there's a the Marvel Renaissance 2 uh, coming <laughs> yeah. to a senator near you <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>